stay. So here we go. Actually, all the committee meetings are going to be this coming Wednesday. We're not going to meet on, there will be no committee meetings on the 6th of July. Um, for the record, Emily Bentley is here. I'll mark you in. Um, so let's get started. Uh, administration and Finance is going to lead off the day this coming Wednesday, the 28th of June at 9 in the morning, and it will go until 9.35. Budget Committee follows from 9.40 to noon. The Land Use and Planning Committee will start the afternoon out at 1 o'clock and go till 2.10. Parks and Conservation meets from 2.15 to 3 o'clock. Public Works will round out the day from 3.05 to 3.20. And all of those meetings are being held right here in the City Council Chambers at 140 West Pine. Thank you, Ms. Rabine. Any changes to the committee schedule? Seeing none, we'll move on to the public comment portion of our agenda. This is your opportunity to comment on items not elsewhere on the agenda this evening. Any general public comment? Candy Matthew Jenkins, 1211 Cooper Street, uh, continuing reading from the Soviet art of brainwashing, psychopolitics, the art of mental healing as read into the uh, Committee on Un-American Activities between 1936 and 1939. The occasion occasioning of sexual li liaisons between females of a target family and well-chosen males under the control of political, psychopolitical operative must be demonstrated to be possible with complete security for the psychopolitical operative. operative. Thus, putting into his hands an excellent weapon for breaking down of familial relations and consequent, uh, consequent public disgrace for the psychopolitical target. Just as a dog can be trained, so can a man be trained. Just as a horse can be trained, so can a man be trained. Se sexual lust, masochism, and any other desirable perversion can be induced by pain drug hypnosis. The techniques of psycho, the techniques of psychopolitics, the changes of loyalties, allegiances, and sources of command can be occasioned easily by the psychopolitical technologies. These should be practiced and understood by the psychopolitical operative before he begin, begins to tamper with uh, psychopolitical targets. Excuse me. of any magnitude or importance. The actual simplicity of the subject of pain drug hypnosis, the use of electric shock, drugs, insanity producing injections, and other materials should be masked entirely by the technical nomen nomenclature by the insistence on future benefit to the patient, by the authoritarian pose and position, and by the careful uh, cultivation and acquisition of governmental positions in a country to be conquered. Any other general public comment this evening? May I comment on the budget information from last week? Certainly. Okay. My name is Bob Moore. I'm in a state of total confusion as to how this is a budget that the mayor submitted to the city council. 
and to the end to the city. Apparently, your actual budget submission was about a million two or so, something like that. And you get another budget of about six million something. The smaller number would increase would have an increase of three point eight, I think it was. The other one, if revenues rise enough, is about eighteen percent. I submit to you that the true budget you're submitting is the one that's eighteen percent. But then again, there's an election coming up. And we don't like eighteen percent increases in the budget. However, it's not even a budget increase. I went to the budget committee, what is it called? Budget committee as a whole. And they're sitting there going through these little tiny items on, isn't worth the waste of time on, uh, as being the budget. Where is the, the uh, um, tens of millions of dollars that the MRA is going to spend? Where is the interest expense on the um, several bond issues that you have approved? Where is all this money at? Does this just go through the air someplace? I'm serious. Does it just go through the air someplace? And how can you submit a budget that the paper picks up as the increase in the budget without even considering what the MRA is going to spend, what you're going to spend on the fairgrounds, by granted, the fairgrounds are looking pretty good now. Um, and they think it's the uh, uh, tax increase for the whole budget. And the only thing is in there is a few things that add up to a million two. I wonder if any citizens would actually believe that this was the actual budget that you were submitting. Thank you. Any other general comment this evening? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kayleen Culverholm. I live at 1906 Strand Avenue in the Franklin South Precinct. I'm also the precinct committee woman for the Democratic Central Committee. I just started, very new to this. Um, I'm not sure if I'm here as a private citizen or as a leader in my area. Maybe a little of both. Um, we're dealing with a situation in our neighborhood at 1900 Strand Avenue and a gentleman by the name of John Ulrich who has um, much involvement with uh, the city and the county are aware of some safety and health issues um, as a result of his tenure there. Um, he, uh, we have issues with rats and infestations going into other people's properties and so forth. Landlords have been trying to get him to move for some time. These are owner occupied. Uh, we rent the space that our mobile homes are on. Um, I've been told that he's working his way through the court system. Um, and, I, and I appreciate that all the different uh, agencies are doing their best presumably, to, uh, to address the issue. However, um, this man has fixated on my family and, my, and myself. Um, we are living in a constant state of fear while he's being allowed to work his way through the court system. I was told last year that his bark is worse than his bite, um, that it's not against the law to be a jerk by a judge when we sought a no contact order against this man. His behavior is now drastically affecting my four-year-old daughter to the point where when I explained to her I needed to go post this letter on his door Sunday because he's refusing certified mail and also because of the current situation where he's the, the mobile home itself is uninhabitable so he's living in an RV on, on the public street. Um, it's a safety issue, just, and there's been many near accidents as a result of how he's parked. Um, health issues, you wouldn't believe, just seeing the property. I have pictures and video if any of you would like to see. I posted this on his door. Um, it's a, a citizen's request to cease menacing and stalking behavior notice. Um, I was hoping that 
if he specifically knew that his behavior was also targeting a young child, he has children of his own, I was hoping that maybe he would stop his behavior. I can't take my daughter t to teach her how to ride her bike. She's turning four next week. I wanted to get her a new bike for her birthday. But because I can't even take her safely to teach her to ride her bike in our own neighborhood without fear of being accosted visually or verbally by this man. I ended up buying her one of those wee things that connects to my bike so she can ride behind me. She's gonna be fine with that, but that's not the point. The point is, is I am not safe to take my little girl out in my own street to teach her how to ride her bike while this man is being allowed to work his way through the court system on multiple violations. Um, he's targeting, and he has targeted um, commissioners. You're pretty popular on his Facebook page right now as well, uh, Mayor Ingham. <laughs> um, aside from going to meetings, committee hearings, things like that, I've notified the authorities. There is a bit of a history, but a couple years old. Um, and if anyone has any questions and would like me to elaborate on what the history is or was, I would be happy to. But the fact of the matter is, is we are trying desperately to move on with our lives. We are not in a position to simply move, um, nor should we have to. We, we've lived there much longer than he has. We're good homeowners and neighbors. We don't bother our neighbors. Um, uh, why don't we just do whatever, and we do what we can to, to ignore him and avoid him. But how do you tell a four-year-old child to cover her eyes and ears on demand because you never know when the next attack is coming? And we live not 50 yards from this man. I have the privilege of when I leave here tonight, I have to go home and fill out the paperwork requesting another no contact order. And I may get the same judge that said it's not illegal to be a jerk. In the meantime, this man is forcing myself and my family to live in a constant state of fear. We are prisoners in our own home, in our own neighborhood, in our own community, if he sees us out and about in the community. Now, I don't know. He said, the, the, the judge said that the way the stalking laws were written here in the state of Montana that I didn't have enough evidence, and I have evidence of his behavior on video, of what we regularly expect from this man. Where I came from originally, I, I transplanted here from Oregon 13 years ago. And I worked closely with, I was in property management, I worked very closely with law enforcement agencies, uh, district attorney's office. Um, we had a menacing ordinance in our community. Menacing behavior. While it may, but this man is stalking us at this point. But if we at least had some sort of menacing order uh, against making people fearful, just because he has broken out a window on our home, he's threatened to chop my daughter's father head off right in front of her. Um, he's used his truck to terrify myself and my daughter while we've been out driving, trying just coming and going. Um, I need help from the community. My neighbors know what's going on. As soon as I can go to the next <clears throat> neighborhood association meeting, I plan on attending that as well. And I hope to serve on the neighborhood association as well. Um, that I already have PTSD, severe PTSD, with extreme anxiety. I'm a survivor of stuff. <laughs> um, and I, I am presently a homemaker on disability, trying to find my way back into society so I can serve my community again like I used to do. And um, when you reach out for help to people in a position to help you, and they tell you things like, his bark's worse than his bite, or it's not illegal to be a jerk, and you're trying to teach your child that this is a safe world to live in, the old saying, it takes a village. It doesn't just apply to our children, it applies to each other. And I need help. I'm scared. Does anyone have any questions for me? So, we, so, so we'll reach out tomorrow and have a conversation, see if we can 
figure out some alternatives. Yeah. We'll be in touch tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Any other general public comment this evening? Sir. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here. My name is Bill Sweeney. I'm originally from Post Creek, which we like to call God's country up there, but I currently reside at 4835 Potter Park Loop in Ward 2. Uh, Ruth Ann is my wife. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, for, for hearing me tonight. I have... Uh, uh, an invitation for you and a point of information. Um, this month is known as the Esiapkenis um, Pakani, the celebration month of the Salish and Pondere people. And many of you know, as, as, and certainly this applies to the members of the audience as well as far as the invitation, um, this coming Thursday, we will begin our 119th annual Arli Esiapkeni, the celebration, the gathering of the people. It's one of the oldest celebrations in the country, um, always held around the 4th of July weekend. And I just would like to formally invite all of you to come, invite your friends, your family. All events are open, all events are free to the public. Um, there will be approximately 62 to 64 local vendors with food, arts and crafts and so forth. Um, there will be competition dancing, social dancing and so forth. There will be some new events this year due to the, the celebration is always held around the 4th of July. So Thursday night will be a memorial celebration and that memorial will be a reading of the names of all of the people who of, of our people as well as friends of the tribes who have passed away in the last year and the names will be read and a procession will take place in the dance arena and anyone is welcome to attend that a few years ago we had the um, lieutenant governor his name's escaping me with uh, brian schweitzer at any rate he he attended and sell and and participated with us that he has re recently lost a son so anyone is welcome at that time um friday will begin the sort of official celebration and there will be uh, the dancing will open around 7 p.m i will be one of the masters of ceremony so Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and then Sunday will conclude the dance competitions. And there will be also gambling. Mr. Mayor, if you'd like to come and learn stick game, I'm sure it's only about $20 a lesson. And uh, <laughs> poker and blackjack as well. And again, it's just, it's just an invitation from the, the people the, the Salish and, and Pondere people, as well as the Aksmaknik, the Kootenai people, for our neighbors in Missoula to come and join with us in celebration this month. There is no um, drugs, alcohol, firearms, or fireworks allowed on, this, on the grounds. Your, your vehicles are subject to search. Um, so just, just be aware of that. Stem. Oh, and dogs have to be on a leash dogs would have to be on a leash so again we just uh, w would welcome your presentation your your participation and uh, mr. mayor I could personally guarantee you that if you showed up at our camp that we would we would welcome you with a meal so thank you everybody thank you mr. Sweeney I appreciate that and I appreciate the coaxing that you received from the councilwoman uh, any other general public comment this evening all right, seeing none, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Items on that agenda were approved unanimously in City Council Standing Committees, and we save a little time on Monday evenings by considering these items all at once. Ms. Rabine will read the list of consent agenda items allowed so those in the audience and those at home will know what we're considering, and we'll take comment on these items before we vote. Ms. Rabine. Thanks, Maringan.
tonight's consent agenda has nine items. And as always, the first item is to approve claims, which are the city's accounts payable. Um, this week, they're in the amount of $935,230.65 for checks that are dated tomorrow, June 27, 2017. Number two is to approve claims, which also are the city account, city's accounts payable related to the water acquisition in the amount of $38,057.55. Number three is to adopt a resolution declaring it to be the intention of the City Council of the City of Missoula, Montana to close and vacate public right-of-way, being a portion of River Street lying east of Russell Street between blocks two and three of Cook's Edition, a recorded subdivision of Missoula County, Montana, located in the southwest quarter of section 21 township 13 north range 19 west principal meridian montana is described and shown in exhibit a and set a public hearing on that whole matter for july 10th 2017. number four is to deny the request to waive the two thousand twenty dollar right-of-way vacation petition fee for review of the request to vacate a portion of River Street Line between blocks two and three of the Cook's edition. Number five is uh, the first reading and preliminary adoption of an ordinance. It is to set a public hearing on July 17, 2017 and preliminarily adopt an ordinance to rezone lot 5A of the Glen edition, lots one, five, and six. It's uh, 60,517 square feet. It's located in section 20, Township 13, North Range, 19 West, platted sub and it's platted subdivision in Missoula County, Montana, according to the official recorded plat located at 217 South Catlin Street between 2nd and Wyoming Streets. From RM 2.7 Residential, which is a multi-dwelling zoning district, to RM 2 Residential, which is a different multi-dwelling district and uh, it's all based on the findings of fact in a staff report and uh, we're also referring that ordinance to the land use and planning committee for a preview prior to the public hearing. Uh, number six is to uh, approve and authorize the mayor to sign the financial con Consulting Solutions Group Incorporated Utility Rate Contract to fund a rate study for the City of Missoula's stormwater, wastewater, and water utilities for an amount not to exceed $172,705. Number seven is a resolution adopting the 2016 Bicycle Facilities Master Plan for the purpose of pursuing a complete, connected, and safe network of facilities for people bicycling in Missoula. Number eight is to adopt a resolution in support of the mayor's action to sign the mayor's National Climate Action Agenda, which is also known as the Climate Mayor's Partner List, and to reaffirm the city, uh, Missoula City Council's interest in actions relating, uh, related to addressing climate change. Number nine, lastly, is to approve and authorize the mayor to sign a construction manager at risk contract with Jackson Contractor Group for the construction of the police evidence facility for $3,750 in pre-construction services plus 4.25% of the total project cost. The project cost is estimated between $1.7 million and $2.2 million. Thank you, Ms. Rabine. <coughs> Would anyone in the audience care to comment on any of the items on the consent agenda this evening? Uh, Bob Moore, I'm sorry. I see in uh, number two, $38,057 for the related to the water acquisition in the amount of $38,000. $34,000 of that is to WGM Group, and I don't know what it is, project number so-and-so about Russell Street Water. I I'd like to know what's that got to do with the acquisition of the Mountain Water Company. Thank you. Candy Matthew Jenkins, I would like to say something about 
the climate action change. I can handle these, okay. <laughs> 12 of 11 Cooper, we're sharing the same notes. Um, we didn't get a vote on the water acquisition. Never went public. We got a poll that polled 55% Democrat. We didn't uh, get a, a vote on the refugee situation that both the county and the city signed letters behind the backs of the citizenry. It wasn't made known that we were gonna do that. We didn't have a vote on the bridge to nowhere and we didn't have a vote on spending taxpayers' money out of uh, the, district, the district that the increments were from for the mall. We didn't get to vote on most everything that this council passes. So you're talking about the voice of the people of the citizens of Missoula but not the taxpayers and not many other citizens that I know. And you're willing to sign us up for this climate change situation that doesn't exist. I know it doesn't exist because you, city council, or anybody in this government did not make this earth. The creator made this earth and if you think he's going to let it, us destroy it by CO2, which you're saying is going to be reduced by 20, 2026, what, 2%? We need CO2 to live. We are animals, we need it. We are plants, we need it. And this whole thing is a hoax. And I, for one, I would like to use a word I won't get away with it, with, but if you're representing the citizens of Missoula in this climate change thing, you better go to the citizens of Missoula and get a vote because you're condemning our business, our economic structures to something that has been proven to be a hoax. And that's three and a half minutes. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Healy Jorgensen and I'm here today on behalf of Climate Smart Missoula, our community's organizational effort to address climate change at the local level. Uh, all of us at Climate Smart are extremely supportive of the resolution in support of Mayor Ingen's action to sign the Mayor's National Climate Action <laughs> Agenda and to reaffirm City Council's interest in, action, interest in actions related to addressing climate change. As the primary entity working to implement cli community, our Community Climate Smart Action Plan, we aim to reduce car carbon pollution and develop resilience sea strategies to help the most vulnerable among us. We are ready to work hand in hand with council, city staff, and community members to find local solutions to make progress relative to the severity of this daunting yet ultimately solvable issue. We, thank, we at Climate Smart thank all of you for bringing this resolution forward, and again, we are fully in support. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else on the consent agenda this evening? John Jenkins, 1211 Cooper Street. I'd also like to comment on the resolution in support of the mayor's action to sign the mayor's national climate action agenda, also known as, known as the climate mayor's partner list, and to reaffirm the Missoula City Council's interest and actions related to addressing climate change. I found it interesting reading through many of the whereases that uh, in this one in particular, climate change has been widely recognized by government, comma, business and academic leaders as a world th worldwide threat with the potential to harm our economy, safety, public health, and quality of life, and that economy was listed first. 
And I thought, well, if this is all about the destruction of the earth and our health and the health of the environment, why do you list economy first? Well, I think it's, it's similar to a, uh, well, I think it's the truth that the economy is exactly what this is about. I believe it is a hoax. I believe that there, uh, that this is because, that that economy was listed because, could it be because there is a lot of money invested in convincing us, the public, that climate change is going to destroy the world? Uh, or make us sick, if you will. Um, and that we are all responsible for climate change, that to convince us of that, and that, it is, that it actually it is a global unifying belief and that those invested would become wealthier and that those of us citizens would also would become um, shamed in using carbon dioxide and natural resources into a control situation. It's to gain more control over societies. Uh, the U.S. being the chief offender because we happen to be uh, the most industrial. Um, we also happen to be one of the cleanest industrial nations, if not the cleanest. So I'll go to another whereas, I can't cover them all, but several dri whereas several drivers of climate change pollution, such as the production and use of energy in buildings, transportation and materials sent to our landfill can be influenced by local governments and the collective action of communities around the world. Well, the local part and landfill, most people are on board with that. But I think that the first part of that, I think the latter part is to, comp to get people's attention past the first. And here we have, such as the production. Drivers of climate pollution, such as the production and use of energy in buildings. Maybe it's a typo, but where is production of energy in buildings other than a power plant? Uh, and if there is being energy produced in Missoula in buildings, that would be a good thing because we're producing our own energy. Energy. So I don't know if that's a typo, but it seems that that's incorrect. And that's three minutes, Mr. Jenkins. In closing, I do not believe in our affecting climate change other than our breathing. And if you would have us go away as people, then I think that that's a wrong belief. Okay. Anyone else on the consent agenda this evening? All right, seeing none, questions or comments from council members? Mr. Von Lossberg? Thanks, I um, wanted to bring up, um, relative to the acquisition cost related to uh, the water utility that, as Mr. Moore noted, um, the lion's share, 34,000 of the $38,000 noted in the agenda has to do with the Russell Street Water Project. Um, we discussed this at committee in public work several weeks ago, and I just wanted to highlight for folks that um, this is actually a great opportunity to take advantage of the time frame uh, when there's going to be work done on Russell Street to install uh, critical municipal um, water mains uh, that will help serve areas of the, of the city that are currently underserved or not served at all. Um, by the municipal water system and indeed this particular line item um, as we've started to see as we've been uh, taking responsibility for operations does not have to do with the acquisition so it might be time to um, change up our nomenclature uh, but this is a really good project uh, that got extensive discussion in public works and is going to be a great benefit for the city under public ownership. Further discussion? All right, seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. This is on items one through nine of the consent agenda. Armstrong. Yes. Armstrong votes yes. Bentley. Bentley votes yes. Cares. Yes. Cares votes yes. Dabari. Yes. Dabari votes yes. Hedall. Yes. Hedall votes yes. Hess. Yes. Hess votes yes. Jones. Yes. Jones votes yes. Marler. Yes. Marler votes yes. Sweeney. Sweeney votes yes. Von Lossberg. Yes. Von Lossberg votes yes. West. Yes. West votes yes. And Wilkins. Yes. Wilkins votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? It's 12 ayes. 
Okay, and we'll move on to comments from city staff agencies, boards, commissions, authorities in the community forum. And we do have a community forum report this evening from Mr. Grimm. Uh, <coughs> greetings, uh, Doug Grimm, Upper Rattlesnake neighborhood. <coughs> um, I uh, have great feeling for you people when you finally acquired the the water company. I, I, uh, I, I know your feelings because in 1946, 71 years ago, my folks moved up to Rattlesnake. And a year later, <coughs> we finally got our well drilled. And so my dad always said that in the interim, we had running water. We had this one room cabin along the creek. And my dad would grab two, two aluminum buckets, run down to the creek, dip them in, run back to the, to the to our shack, <laughs> so we had running water. <laughs> I said a year ago that I lived there in <coughs> 70 years. Well, this is June, <coughs> 71 years on the same piece of land. Well, <coughs> um, we used to have 18 neighborhoods in Missoula, and I think right now we have 20. We had at the meeting last Thursday here in the city council chambers, Jordan <coughs> Lyon, from the Associated Students of University of Montana Records Center, and he explained all of the ways that they advocate for students and uh, renters here in Missoula. We also had a report from Ari Laurel uh, from the YWCA, and she <coughs> talked about their adult and children's services and their housing program. Uh, we had another report from Aaron Brock, the executive director of the food bank, <coughs> and he talked about their new building at Catlin and Wyoming Streets. And now 20 people in their new building can shop and pick up groceries. Uh, 20 people at, at a time be on the floor selecting food. Sometimes 105 families will be accommodated just in one morning. Uh, one and a half million pounds of food are handled through there in just one year. They have about 400 volunteers who work per week. That's, uh, they uh, have about 21,000 individuals per year, and many co only come in six times or less. And they are also now serving lunch for children. And if anyone is interested in seeing the new facilities, they will give tours. Jane Kelly reported um, from the Office of Neighborhoods of which is the head, <coughs> she talked about neighborhood cleanup days. <coughs> Volunteers are encouraged to help. And the Missoula Parks and Recreation Department, um, you can <coughs> volunteer to help the Missoula Parks and Recreation Department with this. Jane also talked about her leadership training session, which she attended <coughs> in Minneapolis. And she uh, drug out a chalkboard here and explained one of the ways that you can uh, get public feedback on a certain topic by pulling it out of the people uh, and writing it down on the chart. Karen Gasvoda, the secretary, had to sign up to represent the city of Missoula at the cemetery. Um, well, that, that kind of sounds strange, but uh, we will be uh, passing out treats and talking about our neighborhood's activities um, and it's called the Stories and Stones program. <coughs> it will take place the same day as the Sunday Streets program, <coughs> which is September 17th from 12.30 to uh, 3.30. We will be at the Stories and Stones uh, event. Uh, the trail along the uh, big power lines uh, that cross the Rattlesnake uh, on the east side of the valley we have heard that the trail has now been completed. And Michelle Kerr's suggested <coughs> in her report uh, that uh, <coughs> some of the neighborhood reports that we get from the uh, neighbors at the end of the meeting, maybe I should have talked to some of those about, it, tell you some of the things that are happening in our neighborhoods. Ron Larson from Grant Creek, Grant Creek said that he, uh, the Missoulian, <coughs> had a story on fire assessment um, that is to prevent the forest fire <coughs> like, they had one, like they, one they had last year. 
I'm <coughs> sorry that <coughs> I didn't take a <coughs> get a flu shot 20 years ago and I damaged my vocal cords. So <laughs> when I talk, it uh, irritates them and makes it a bit. I feel like I need to cough. Okay. Secondly, he said that Republic Guard, the Republic Garbage Services, have um, agreed to pick up the garbage uh, at a later hour, and that's to help the bear uh, uh, manage the pro 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 uh, problem or issue. Uh, this was simply done by Republic Garbage by rerouting the trucks to a different area of the city earlier in the day and then coming up uh, Miller Creek, or um, Grant Creek, rather. Jack Walton of Miller Creek, uh, two, he's talked about the two um, general meetings uh, they're going to have on July 12th and August 22nd, and uh, the <coughs> chip ceiling and the, the <coughs> striping on Linda Vista Boulevard was discussed. <coughs> um, and Julie uh, Devlin from the Rose Park neighborhood reported that St. Joseph School, which for many years I think was known as the Roosevelt School, a public school, it, I think I'm correct on that, um, when, uh, when it was a public school, all the children in the neighborhood played in the playground, and lately Joseph School have decided that uh, they wanted to close that off, but the neighbors have resolved the issue and are going to let the neighborhood children <coughs> use the playground from now on again. The River Road neighborhood and Two Rivers neighborhood councils have met and talked about a trail that will um, uh, go through the Two Rivers neighborhood and through their neighborhood to the Hawthorne School. And there's a, a walkway, I guess, underneath uh, uh, Re Reserve Street and it will go all day down third through the, the Russell School. It's going to be a safe passage. You may not have heard about this. It's just in the talking stage right now, but it'll be <coughs> there'll be more talk about this <coughs> next year. And River Road uh, neighborhood, Mary Laporte reported that she has received complaints of speeding on California Street, and she requests that street improvements be done area. And the sawmill district has expressed noise issues, um, has experienced noise issues from the Loyola athletic field. Um, some neighbors here uh, have talked to the principal of the school and their meeting uh, has been very cordial so far. I guess that would be the end of the report except um, I got a an anonymous letter here from the Parks Department, uh, no name, and uh, it has really uh, uh, crushed me to, uh, <coughs> that uh, I have worked for 35 years with my neighbors building and, and uh, uh, stone structures here and there on the Hamilton Day Irrigation Ditch in the Rattlesnake. and. Uh, uh, Someone has been very mean to write this, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure who, but uh, it really crushed me because uh, it looks like if I go up there and, and do any more stonework to finish it off, it doesn't say if I'll go to jail, but uh, <laughs> I'm just wondering. Um, anyway, it kind of it seems funny, funny, you know, as soon as you acquire the water system, that um, if the ditch was closed off, there's a bunch of people that would be forced to irrigate with uh, Missoula water, and that would probably increase their watering fees maybe by $500 a month. That's what one lady told me would cost her for her property. Anyway, it's really devastated me, and I, I sometimes feel like uh, there's some people that uh, just upset you so much you feel like jumping off the, the Higgins Avenue Bridge. Well, thanks. So, <clears throat> Mr. Grimm, I didn't hear all of that, but we'll have, I'll have Parks reach out to you tomorrow. Yeah. We'll see what we can figure out. All right. We will move on, ladies and gentlemen, to the public hearing portion of our agenda.
state law and our own council rules uh, set guidelines for inviting community comment on a variety of issues and following a staff report on each of these council and I will invite comment as will commissioners this evening council typically votes on the same evening as the public hearing unless one uh, council member elects to return that item to committee for further consideration our first public hearing this evening is on a resolution uh, to expend open space bond proceeds and our staff report this evening comes from ms erickson thank you mayor Ingen. good evening city council members and county commissioners uh, my name is Elizabeth Erickson and I'm the open space acquisitions attorney for the city parks department and I am here to help present the Western Montana Retriever Club open space bond proposal which is a request to expend up to $12,000 of uh, 2006 open space bond funds of the city's portion to fund transaction and project related costs for a donated private conservation easement um, across the 50 acre Western Montana Retriever Club property. And the property is situated between the Bitterroot River and Lower Miller Creek Road. And tonight uh, we have Sarah Ritchie from Five Valleys Land Trust um, who's going to present the project. Five Valleys is the sponsor of the project. And then I will give a short staff report and then Lisa Moisey will provide the staff report for the county. I'll turn it over to Sarah Ritchie. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, and City Council members. Uh, my name is Sarah Ritchie, and I am a Conservation Project Manager with Five Valleys Land Trust. And as Elizabeth said, I'm here tonight um, with a conservation project. Um, this is an open space bond funding request for a donated conservation easement that's adding um, additional lands to an existing conservation easement, um, all on lands owned by the Western Montana Retriever Club. Um, so this is a situation where there's privately owned land and the landowner is seeking to protect those conservation values um, with a conservation easement. In this case, that conservation easement is a donation from the landowner. Um, they're not seeking funds to cover the costs of the, conser of the conservation easement itself, but um, there are transaction costs associated with, the, with doing the conservation easement, and that's what we're here tonight seeking is up to $12,000 in, in those costs. Um, the property is um, uh, 50 acres in total and it's on the south end of town on the banks of the Bitterroot River. Um, <clears throat> it's sandwiched between Lower Miller Creek Road and the Bitterroot River um, to the north there and then the um, Linda Vista Golf Course to the east. And the, um, the property, the northeast corner of the property in the blue hash marks there is the existing seven acre conservation easement and this was um, granted by the Western Montana Retriever Club back in 1989 and Five Valleys Land Trust holds that conservation easement. Um, and then in more recent years, the Western Montana Retriever Club came to Five Valleys um, looking for a way to protect in perpetuity the rest of their land holdings, which they'd acquired since then. Um, so 43 additional acres um, is what they're wishing to protect. And we're working with them to do uh, to amend their original conservation easement to add 43 acres um, and then end up with a, a total 50 acre conservation easement. Um, <coughs> And um, conservation amendments are rare. Um, this is, they're, they're usually only done to correct an error, like an error in a legal description, or to add significant conservation values. And so this is one of those cases where we're adding 43 acres of uh, um, additional open space land to the conservation easement. So the property um, includes about a half mile of the Bitterroot River, of the riverfront, and the riparian corridor. And then there's also numerous ponds and sloughs um, associated with the property um, that support a diverse wetland vegetation. Here's some, some photos of that, the wetland and the vegetation there. Um, the wetland habitats host um, a variety of uh, different wetland um, uh, plants, including two rare plants um, identified by the Native Plant Society and then habitat for wildlife, um, especially bird species, waterfowl, great blue heron, osprey, woodpeckers, and many species of songbird um, utilize this area. 
Um, the property has also been used uh, as a classroom and a learning opportunity um, by both Audubon Society and Native Plant Society, also um, wetland ecology, uh, field trips for school kids and such. Um, and that's all the, uh, the Western Montana Retriever Club has, has hosted in the past. So the goals for this project um, are to protect in perpetuity through the conservation easement restrictions, the habitat, including the wetland and riparian habitat, um, the open space lands, um, the scenic views, um, especially from the Bitterroot River, this is a popular stretch to float, um, and then also from Lower Miller Creek Road and then the Linda Vista subdivision up above. Um, this, I'll note that this is not a public access project. Um, through, through conservation easements, private landowners can provide public values, and in some cases, public access. And this one um, will not include access, but it also doesn't preclude a landowner granting public access in the future if that's, if that's appropriate in the future. Um, so the conservation easement um, that, we'll, that we're um, working on will unite the entire 50 acres as one property, so it won't be divided. Um, in the future and then limit um, all development and structures in a way that protects that open space and, and um, habitat and scenic values. Um, there, are no resident, there, there are no residences on the property now and the conservation easement prohibits that in the future as well. Um, so the, the funding request is for up to $12,000. The transaction costs in the end will probably be less than that, between 10 and 11,000 more likely as shown here. And these transaction costs include um, the baseline and hazardous materials survey, title insurance, title research, um, mineral research, and then recording and closing fees. And then it also includes a perpetual maintenance and monitoring um, costs, which is ensures that the easement will be monitored over time in perpetuity. Um, if our funding request is successful, um, this project would close very soon, likely this summer. Um, and then this is, this is the third or fourth time that Five Valleys have, has worked with landowners um, here in Missoula County who are willing to donate a conservation easement on their property, but the, where the transaction costs um, make that a challenge to do. Um, so we feel fortunate to be able to come to the Missoula County Open Space Bond to be able to ask for support for, for these projects that otherwise may not happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> I'll just add a couple of additional details. Um, the conservation easement project, it accomplishes a number of the specific purposes of the 2006 open space bond, which includes protecting wildlife habitat, uh, providing open space and scenic landscape, protecting water quality of rivers, lakes, and streams, and also paying non-personnel related transaction and project related costs. Um, those are actually the terms that are on, were in that actual ballot language for the 2006 open space bond. And the project is consistent with the goals of the city's open space plan um, and the city's open space ordinance. And it is also located partly within the Bitterroot River open space cornerstone. And the plan and the ordinance uh, prioritize protecting our river corridors um, for the reasons that Sarah discussed. And um, the project received a unanimous recommendation from the city's open space advisory committee, which advises the city council and uh, at its May 11th meeting, as articulated in the letter of support. And if this project is uh, approved at the requested funding level, um, there will be approximately $492,000 left in the city's portion of the 2006 open space bond. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa Moisey to provide the staff report for the county. Thank you, commissioners, mayor, and council for hearing this project tonight. My name is Lisa Moisey. I manage the county's Parks, Trails, and Open Lands program. And I'm here um, as county staff to give the county staff report for this project. In June of this year, the Board of County Commissioners determined that the project is a qualified open space project, and they adopted a reimbursement resolution which qualified the project for funding through the open space bond. The city-county agreement related to the open space bond states that the Board of County Commissioners shall approve a qualified open space project recommended by the City Council unless the project has substantially changed in scope and no longer meets the purposes of the open space bond fund or evidence presented raises questions about the lawfulness of the project 
and the board determines that the project is unlawful. Staff, county staff has reviewed this project and finds that neither of those are the case and that the project meets the purposes of the open space bond as Elizabeth just outlined and county staff recommends that the Board of County Commissioners approve the project for funding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moisey. With that, on behalf of the city, I'll open the public hearing. Commissioners? On behalf of the commissioners, county commissioners, I'll open our um, hearing. Anyone care to comment on this proposed expenditure of open space funds? Mr. Lindler. Members of Missoula City Council and county commissioners, I am Bert Lindler, a member of the Open Space Advisory Committee. The committee unanimously supports the acquisition of a conservation easement on 43 additional acres of land along the Bitterroot River owned by the Western Montana Retriever Club. The committee greatly appreciates the club's generosity in donating the value of the easement. The request of up to $12,000 from the 2006 bond to cover the transaction and project related cost is quite reasonable. For many years to come, the residents of Missoula and persons floating the Bitterroot will have the benefit of open space vistas in an increasingly developed portion of the city. Wildlife and rare plants will benefit as the area's wetlands, riparian forests, and grasslands remain intact. Thanks for your support of what will soon become the latest addition to Missoula's open space protected using 2006 open space bond funds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindler. <clears throat> Council members and uh, commissioners, I'm Jim Brown, 1504 Woods Gulch here in Missoula. I uh, represent uh, Five Valleys Audubon. I just want to emphasize the wildlife habitat values. They are pretty amazing here with the diversity of niches. There's the wetlands of various sizes and kinds, there's the river itself, and then there's a small area of old growth cottonwood that uh, cavity nesting birds really take advantage of. But in addition to this varied uh, habitat, which also supports quite a diversity of birds, there's the big picture part of this, and that is that it's a piece of our river bottomlands, and that's so valuable and so limited here in our state that is especially uh, significant. So I think it's an opportunity to protect a piece of these river bottom uh, lands, and I hope that you'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <clears throat> Anyone else this evening? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm June Letterer. I am uh, president of the uh, board of directors of the Western Montana Retriever Club, and I just wanted to come and tell you a little bit about the club. Um, it was founded over 60 years ago, and right now um, we have about 45 members. Everybody renews their membership annually or not. Um, the way that we acquired the land in the first place was that the founding, two of the founding fathers um, owned this land, and they leased it to the club until they passed away, and at that time the club was able to buy everything but where the current conservation is right now that we purchased at a separate time. But the majority of the land was owned by the original members and then we bought it. I'm not sure when, and I don't know for how much, but it was probably a bargain. So we are very grateful um, that we've been able to enter into this conservation agreement with Five Valleys. Um, it just made sense that we, since we have the, exist, the original one that we did in 1989, to amend it and to incorporate the other 43 acres to make one big easement. Because we don't know if the club is gonna be around for another 60 years, but we wanna make sure that this land is preserved and protected and stays just as beautiful as it is now forever. Um, when we first started talking about doing the easement over three years ago, um, we found out how much it would cost, even though it was a donated easement at that point, we almost said, no, we can't do this because we can't afford to do this. We're a small club, we're a nonprofit, and uh, we don't have a lot of money. And so without the help of the Open Space Bond Fund, this would never have come to a pass. So we just want to say how grateful we are to everybody that's made this work, to Five Valleys Land Trust, and to um, everybody that has a say in the Open Space Bond Fund. We thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? 
this evening. John Jenkins, 1211 Cooper Street. I noticed when the costs were listed that it looked like approximately $7,000 for protection and conservation. What, how do you protect all that land? Do you put something around it? Do you stand there and guard it? What does protection entail and why does it cost $7,000? Anyone else this evening? All right. With that, I will close the public hearing. Commissioner? I'll close the county's portion. Are there questions from council members? Mr. Dabari? So I think I have two questions. Uh, the first one, I, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but for the woman who is associated with the Western Montana Retriever Club, would you mind stepping up to the microphone? Um, as a part of the discussion during committee, um, we talked a little bit about the kinds of access that mm -hmm. is available and i'm wondering if you can describe for us okay. again in the audience yeah what so, kind of public okay. access is permitted okay right now the only access is for uh, club members or club guests members of guests or if we have an, an event like a field trial or a hunt test or something like that the club was um, founded for retriever training and that's primarily what we do do there um, we do let people use it for, you know, any kind of dog training, retriever training, or just for exercising, that kind of thing. But it is not open to, like, members of Linda Vista or public, the public in Linda Vista that want to come and use the club. They have to be a member. Can I follow up? One of the things that was mentioned during the public, um, sorry, the committee meeting was uh, access for school children. Could you describe that? Yeah, that hasn't happened for a few years. I think that was that was done before I was a member of the club, but we have had mostly the uh, plant groups and um, the bird watchers, that kind of thing to come out. But we would certainly be open if somebody approached us about bringing kids out. Great, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next question, I, I, I think I'm gonna tap Ms. Ritchie for that. Thank okay. you so much, I appreciate it. So um, a constituent reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and expressed some concern with um, providing public money for uh, an easement that has little public access. And so um, I tried sharing some of my thoughts about the, the general community-wide benefits that go along with conservation easements. And Mr. Brown and Mr. Lindler mentioned several, but I'm wondering if you can speak to some of the larger conservation and other values that are associated with protection of land such as this even though there might be a limited amount of public access. Sure, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think that all of us value public access and that's clearly a public benefit that is um, important to everyone. And so um, with conservation easements, we look at a host of public benefits. Um, and in this particular project, we're looking at um, habitat values, especially those wetland and riparian uh, values that um, as Jim Brown mentioned, are, are just rare on the overall landscape, um, more and more scarce. Um, and then the open space values of just not having development in, on, the, on the 50 acres there. Um, and then the scenic values for members of the public that are on the river corridor, traveling on Lower Miller Creek Road, or living in the area. Um, and that those open space pieces, um, even, those, even those views or even the habitat values that wildlife use are important um, to all of us in the area. So this project focuses on those. Um, um, access remains uh, uh, the land, uh, at the landowner's discretion. So that's a right that the landowner would not be granting through this conservation easement. Um, but remain at their discretion and opening to um, school children or, or other Audubon Native Plant Society, as June mentioned, they can continue to do that. Um, and the other point I'll make is just thinking in the long view, um, Western Montana Retriever Club may not always own this land, um, and what we're focused on is um, perpetuity and, and long term, no matter who the landowner is, that this land is still there and that that opportunity is still there, whether that be for public access in the future or it just remains um, the habitat and the open space values. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if 
one of the speakers tonight could just say who the founding fathers of the club were that sold it ultimately to to the club because I think it's an interesting part of Missoula history and there's probably some people yeah, here who remember was, them. Uh, I believe it was Guy Barnett and Reg Kessler or Shorty Kessler. Okay. Further questions? Commissioners? Questions? I just wanted to add the other um, piece um, in regard to public access because I had someone call me about that too is that um, because of the use of the um, retriever club right now it doesn't make a lot of sense to have everyone um, have access to go walk their dogs when they're trying to train dogs of how to um, you know respond to commands and signals and all of that stuff so it, it isn't a good fit for what's there now but it, it could be in the future as you said if the if the retriever club isn't there forever. Um, I'd also like to, to thank the Retriever Club for coming forward to protect the, the rest of the land that um, isn't under conservation easement. And I think that the investment of public dollars in this um, um, doesn't make us feel like we should all have access to it either. <laughs> it's, a, it's a small investment. With that, Commissioner, would you like to make a motion? Certainly. Um, Commissioner Curtis, I move that the Missoula Board of County Commissioners adopt a resolution approving the expenditure of up to $12,000 of the city's portion of the 2006 open space bond funds for the project related costs of a conservation easement on 50 acres based on findings that the project qualifies for funding, that the city has referred a recommendation of approval, that the project meets the purposes of the open space bond, and that the project has not been determined unlawful contingent on receipt of the signed city approval resolution. I'll second that motion. Is there further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I like this deal where you only have to have two people make it <laughs> work. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion from Mr. Oh, in this case, Mr. Von Losper. Thank you. I move uh, adoption of a resolution of the Missoula City Council to expend up to $12,000 of 2006 open space bond proceeds to cover transaction and project related costs for donated conservation easement across 50 acres of land owned by the Western Montana Retriever Club adjacent to the Bitterroot River. And may I speak to it briefly? Mr. Von Losberg. I just want to quickly thank the good folks involved with this. Um, Sir Richie from Five Valleys, thanks very much. It's, uh, as always, Five Valleys is a great partner in work like this. Uh, Ms. Erickson, thanks for your continued work. Staff from the county. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Lindler, it's good to see you here from the Open Space Advisory Committee. Um, we're blessed to have uh, that committee do its good work. So thank you for the review and the recommendation. And most importantly, thank you to the folks from the Western Montana Retriever Club. Um, it's generous and uh, far-sighted for the community, so thank you very much. Further discussion on the motion? Mr. Wilkins? So you know I'm always happy to uh, support things like this, but I'm starting to have second thoughts, and that's because of the public access. It's public money. Uh, I wish we could put a trail in there, keep people on the trail, and I know that's hard to do, that we could look and see the birds and all that and I appreciate the retriever club but it's public money we're putting out here and uh, the public's benefiting in a way but not totally so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna support this but I'm also thinking of my uh, two-year-old grandsons and they're gonna live in Missoula and the access for them to see things like that somewhere in the future so hope some way we can work out to have better public access if it's nothing but a viewing area and binoculars so anyway thanks for all you've done Ms. Bentley on the motion I support the motion um, I went on a field trip to this site it's beautiful I stood there with my eyes closed and all I could hear was tons and tons and tons of birds chirping it was quite lovely and it was obvious that there was a lot of wildlife and um, I'm glad that it's been preserved I'm there's a lot of sprawl out that way and it's it's nice to have uh, that space I think 
the point of um, open space isn't, it's nice to have access, but um, it's not always the point. It's really about preserving these ecosystems and um, the connectivity between the wildlife areas. So, and it is accessible if you float by on a tube. So I support it. Ms. Kears? Like Council Member Bentley and Commissioner Curtis, I was out at the site on the field trip as a birder, I found it as an excellent afternoon and am sad that more people won't have access to it. But agree with um, Council Member Bentley's comments that that's not our only consideration and that it's a balance between public access and uh, lack thereof. We ask everyone who we interview for the Open Space Advisory Commission um, spots you know how they feel about that relationship because we understand that it's an important consideration of open space bonds and we always select folks who end up saying it's a balance of um, access and preservation so i understand the concerns but um, we'll be supporting it wholeheartedly mr debari i'm going to support the motion as well and uh, i can't say any better what i was intending to say Ms. cares covered it so um, i'm good thanks Further discussion? Seeing none, we've had a public hearing. We'll have a roll call vote. On the motion to adopt a resolution, Bentley. Bentley votes yes. Cares. Yes. Cares votes yes. Dabari? Yes. Dabari votes yes. Heddle? Yes. Heddle votes yes. Hess? Hess votes yes. Jones? Jones votes yes. Marler? Yes. Marler votes yes. Sweeney? Sweeney votes yes. West? West votes yes. Wilkins? Yes. Wilkins votes yes. Armstrong? Yes. Armstrong votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? That is 12 ayes. And the motion is approved. Con uh, commissioners, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Point, point of order, I just don't think I got the vote. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I skipped right over. I would like to vote enthusiastically, yes. Von Lossberg votes yes. He was already in the count. We've just started assuming things about you, Mr. Von Lossberg. All right. <laughs> now the motion is even more approved. Uh, commissioners, thank you for your continued support of the program and taking time this evening. You're welcome to stay. You did your time. <laughs> Our second public hearing this evening is on a request to rezone. Uh, a portion of Wyoming Street at 1801 Wyoming and our staff report this evening comes from Mr. Larson. All right, good evening, Drew Larson, Development Services. And tonight I am presenting a request to rezone property located at 1801 Reserves or Wyoming Street uh, from the existing RM 2.7 multi-dwelling zoning district to the new RM 2 zoning district. Um, unfortunately, there was a little bit of a miscommunication between my office and uh, the city clerk's office and we did not get the first reading of the ordinance in until last Monday where it was supposed to be two weeks ago. And so state law advertisements, um, we can't actually take action this evening but we did advertise the public hearing along with the planning board public hearing. And so uh, in consultation with the city clerk's office, we're gonna hold the public hearing. We can likely have discussion this evening, but we can't take final action until July 10th uh, city council meeting. And I've spoken with the applicants and um, well, I mean, state law is pretty, pretty clear about that. So, uh, but they were okay with the postponement. Uh, and so just one more thing, this rezoning will result in a standard zoning district under Title 20, which can, cannot be conditioned. So the subject property is located near the intersection of Wyoming Street and North Catlin Street. Uh, the property is accessed from Wyoming Street and from the Milwaukee Trail located south of the subject property. Um, so the subject property is highlighted, well, it's not highlighted, but in the black crosshatch and then the Milwaukee Trail kind of does this weird little jog here, but at the southwest corner uh, is an access point to the Milwaukee Trail. Uh, the property currently contains 46 dwelling units with it within three multi-dwelling buildings which were constructed in the early 2000s. 
Uh, the subject property is currently sur or is surrounded by a mix of residential, commercial, and industrial uses, including multi-dwelling to the north and west and manufacturing to the east along North Catlin Street. The applicable regional plan is the R. Missoula City Growth Policy 2035, which recommends a land use designation of residential medium to high. Uh, this comes with a recommended density uh, span of 12 to 23 dwelling units per acre. The areas designated residential medium to high are identified as areas close to the core of the community and where city services and infrastructure are readily available uh, and with the following zoning district listed as most relatable. That's RT 2.7, RM 2.7, which it's currently zoned, uh, a mobile home RMH, an R3, uh, as well as this RM2, which was created during our last Title 20 maintenance that created a zoning district on that upper end of the 12 to 23 dwelling units per acre because before all we had was uh, 16 was our max and then it went to 43 and so we didn't really have anything in between but that's where the RM2 came from. Uh, so the city growth policy also calls for a focused inward approach which encourages infill development in the urban core where infrastructure already exists, uh, promotes mixed use development, increased den density, uh, and promotes enhanced connectivity while limiting sprawl and encouraging efficient use of existing infrastructure. So as noted earlier, the subject property is currently zoned RM 2.7. This goes from uh, North Catlin Street to the west to North Curtis uh, and then is bounded up on, on the upper limits. Um, I can't remember specifically which streets those are. Uh, and then directly to the east is C24, which is a community commercial uh, which is one of our more intensive commercial zoning districts. So just going through some of the standards of the uh, current zoning, uh, RM2, this permits all residential building types uh, from single detached homes to multi-dwelling buildings. The minimum parcel size is 3,000 square feet, so the minimum lot, ha or the lot has to be 3,000 in order to have a residential use. Uh, and then the minimum parcel area per unit is 2,700 square feet. Uh, which again is approximately 16 dwelling units per acre. Uh, setbacks are 20 feet front and rear, and then five foot side interior setbacks. Uh, the height is 30 or 35 feet depending on the roof pitch. In addition, in the RM2 zoning district, it was created to allow the existing commercial and industrial uses that were within that neighborhood to exist, but not as non-conformities, but to continue to exist as long as there are in place and Title 20 provides some substitutions, uh, replacement of those uh, existing commercial and industrial uses. So the real difference between the uh, proposed zoning and the existing is that the minimum parcel area is now 2,000 square feet, which is about 21 dwelling units per acre, uh, an increase of five per acre. Uh, and then the height requirements, it goes from that 30, 30 to 35 feet to a maximum height of 45 feet in the zoning district. This zoning district does eliminate that if there were any commercial and industrial uses, those would then become non-conforming and Title 20 addresses those as well. So just a couple quick photos. Uh, I tried to brighten these up a little bit, but in the top right corner up here is looking towards the property from the trail and this is an informal trail connection that um, if the rezoning is approved and the uh, landowner is allowed to in, uh, construct new multi-dwelling building on the site would likely be formalized at the time of building permit. Um, and the Parks and Rec actually would review that and they would have to build it to their standards. And so the top right corner is that informal connection looking uh, away from the property. And then the bottom picture is the uh, existing open space that's down at the bottom. It's about approximately 24 to 25 percent of the the entire site. So just a few photos from Wyoming Street. Uh, Wyoming Street, it has two access points here. There's covered parking, uh, curb gutter sidewalks are all in place and is constrained slightly by the existing ditch uh, there on the south end of Wyoming or south edge of Wyoming. So getting into review criteria, um, these criteria address whether the proposed zoning amendment is in accordance with the following. Uh, one, the growth policy. Two, facilitates the provision of motorized and active transportation facilities and other public infrastructure like water and sewer. 
promotes compatible urban growth, promotes public health and safety, and considers the character of the district. So the proposed rezone does comply with the goals and objectives of the growth policy, as well as the land use designation of re residential medium high, that's that 12 to 23, with the RM2 being on the upper end of that, that threshold. Uh, the rezoning promotes compatible urban growth and facilitates the adequate provision of public services, including transportation, water, sewer, uh, schools, parks, um, and other public requirements. Um, because the area is within the urban growth area and is already served by public infrastructure. The rezoning will promote public health, public safety, and the general welfare with access to sewer, public water, emergency services, streets, Missoula's trail network, and other urban services. Uh, and the rezoning is suitable for the subject property and gives reasonable consideration to the character of the district by providing uses appropriate for uh, lands with a residential medium high land use designation and the surrounding commercial, industrial, and other multi-dwelling in the area. So on June 6th, the Missoula Consolidated Planning Board met to discuss the proposed city rezone. Uh, the dis discussion was focused on the loss of open space within the district and the upzoning to the RM2. Uh, uh, there's the, the River Road neighborhood does have a, a short supply of parks. There's one located about four blocks to the north west of this subject property and that's Lafray Park. Um, so the existing activity area, uh, as noted earlier, it's actually about 30,000 square feet. This was just some rough measurements I did uh, on an aerial Google Maps, um, which, you know, based again on some very rough calculations is about 24, 25% of the existing site. Uh, so Title 20 requires a 20% activity area as well as 15% general landscaping. Um, so the, the activity area can consist of balconies, uh, porch or uh, patios, uh, greenways that connect the subject property to uh, our trail network, uh, activity area that's a large contiguous um, open space play area. Um, so yeah. Those, those things, that was the one discussion of, or one of the discussion points is the loss of open space. Uh, another one was they were concerned with the congestion on Wyoming Street. Uh, so traffic counts on the uh, Wyoming were estimated about 2,100 trips per day between Curtis and Russell Street. Uh, the street width I have here I think has actually been not completely accurate and Mr. Harvey is here to speak to Wyoming things uh, following my presentation or any questions you may have. Uh, and then uh, finally the planning board, uh, planning board members still express concern regarding the city rezone process. Uh, some of the planning board members would like to see that the city initiate rezonings to reflect the, the recent 2015 or the 2035 growth policy. So on Friday last week, uh, I did receive a few questions because we did run out of uh, time and committee from council members. And so I did circulate a memo. I'm hoping most of you saw that or had an opportunity to read that. Uh, there were seven questions. That was the Milwaukee Trail. Here, I'll just bring this up real quick. So the Milwaukee Trail currently, you know, it comes in on Catlin here, dips down, goes on to Trail Street, and then comes up here. And so. The first question was, uh, would development on the subject property in this area preclude uh, a straightening out of the Milwaukee Trail? So instead of it coming south and being on existing right-of-ways, that it would continue on a trail uh, just south of the property. Um, and the answer to that question is that they do have a 20-foot rear setback, as well as there's a 10 to 12-foot right-of-way just uh, um, south of the subject property. And Parks and Rec did note that that would likely be wide enough to uh, accommodate that trail. Let's see here. Uh, so yeah, we did talk about the existing trail connection being formalized from the subject property to the Milwaukee Trail. Um, and that again would be caught at building permit. The on-site parking, uh, the question was, is the site currently over parked? Um, and I gave a, a good answer. The, the property was developed under our previous zoning ordinance, Title 19, which had a different parking requirement and often was a larger parking requirement than today. Uh, and so under Title 20, if development were to occur and the rezone were to occur, they would need to do a new parking calculation. And so I, I can't confirm 
or deny with information that I have today that, uh, that, that the site is over parked or under parked. Uh, the growth policy is the residential medium high. Uh, I apologize if my map was confusing during the committee meeting. Uh, the fifth question was, is, has the RM2 zoning district been applied to anywhere else in the city of Missoula? And this is the first request to rezone property to RM2 and would be the first uh, rezoning if approved on July 10th. Uh, so yep, we talked about the open space that is a uh, must maintain a 20% activity area and that's through balconies, porches, greenways, uh, as well as an outdoor play area. And then the Wyoming Street, that there are portions that are not currently built to city standards. There are some uh, lack of curbs, people parking within the street, and that's triggered at um, any new development, change to your access, or an increase in, in the existing use by a, a certain square footage. Um, but also, speaking with Mr. Harvey, prior to that, that uh, it's on, the, it's on the list to be redone within the next few years, and he expects that to be done within the next five to 10 years. So with that, uh, staff recommends approval of the rezone to RM2 residential based on the findings of fact in the staff report. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, you, I am here to answer them. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, Mr. Larson. With that, I will open the public hearing on the proposed rezoning. Anyone care to comment? Good evening. Jeff Smith with WGM Group representing the Martin family tonight for that presentation. Let's see if I can pull up here. Uh, thanks to Drew for his uh, great work on this project and, and the staff report. Um, as he mentioned, this is a request to rezone 1801 Wyoming Street, which is uh, commonly referred to as a Wolf Glen Apartments. Uh, from RM 2.7 to RM 2. The Wolf Glen Apartments uh, were built in 2001 under the Title 19 zoning ordinance. There's currently 46 units present on the site, which is the maximum allowed based on RM 2.7's uh, residential density. Average occupancy at Wolf Glen has been 98%. There are currently, excuse me, there are currently three generations of the Martin family who are actively involved with the operation of Wolf Glen. Uh, members of the younger two generations have become licensed department operators, uh, take a hands-on role in day-to-day -day operations, and uh, know their tenants by name. Martins provide affordable, affordable workforce housing for several segments of Missoula's population, including veterans, elderly, and disabled. Currently, 25% of Wolf Glen's population are elderly and disabled tenants. Six of their units are currently rented to uh, clients of Volunteers of America. Volunteers of America is a veterans assistance organization. Martins take an interest in serving, in serving veterans and typically notify Volunteers of America first when there's a vacancy. Several members of the Martin family are here tonight and are excited to answer any questions that you may have. So Wolf Glen is located in the River Road neighborhood. It's along the south side of Wyoming Street. Milwaukee Trail is adjacent to the site in the uh, southwest corner. Uh, Mountain Lines Route 2 Bolt Route is, is uh, located at the intersection of Russell and, and the Milwaukee Trail and is walkable from the site. Uh, services nearby, including the Good Food Store and the newly opened Food Bank, which is just across Wyoming Street from the site, are, are walkable. During preparation of our application, we met with the River Road Neighborhood Leadership Team. Uh, the rezoning proposal was generally well received by the leadership team with a few comments regarding provision for future extension of the Milwaukee Trail and the want to ensure that off-street parking uh, is maintained at adequate levels. Wolf Glen is located near the center of an area designated for residential medium to high density in the Armazula 2035 growth policy. The next few slides discuss how rezoning the Wolf Glen property to RM2 helps to fulfill the focus inward goals of the growth policy. Rezoning to an RM2 district would help fulfill the following housing goals and objectives. Increase the overall supply of decent, safe, and affordable homes for renters. Locate higher to mid-density housing convenient to transit, bike, and walking routes. Create zoning districts and rezone land to allow for diverse housing that is compatible with the surrounding area. Cultivate leadership to support rezoning of lands to allow multi-dwelling residential units in appropriate areas. 
The last bullet point here is more focused on design than zoning, but I've included it because of the Martin's focus on service for the elderly and disabled. Any expansion at Wolf Glen will include fully accessible units on the ground floor. Rezoning Wolf Glen to an RM2 zoning district will help fulfill the community design goals and objectives of the growth policy by creating an opportunity for additional workforce housing in the area, uh, in an area with existing infrastructure and trails and in proximity to the urban core. Current zoning at Wolf Glen and over most of the area designated for uh, medium to high residential density is RM2.7. RM2.7 allows one dwelling unit for every uh, 2,700 square feet, resulting in a density of about 16 units per acre, which is just below the midpoint of that medium to high residential density range of 12 to 23. The RM2 zoning district was created in 2016 as a tool to implement the medium to high uh, residential density of the focused inwards goals outlined in the growth policy. RM2 district allows one for every 2,000 square feet and allows a density of just over 21 units per acre. Following slides provide an overview of the existing site and a discussion of possibilities created by rezoning to RM2. Total property area is 2.9 uh, one acres in size and using that 2,700 square feet per unit is developed at maximum density with 46 units. The existing density, again, is below the midpoint of that medium to high residential density range. 92 existing parking spaces on site, which is uh, two parking spaces for each one, two, and three bedroom unit, and is in excess of the zoning requirement under Title 20 by uh, nearly 40 spaces. For multifamily residents, this zoning requires that 20% of the parcel area be developed in outdoor activity area, and 15% of the site be developed with general site landscaping for a total landscaping area of 35%. Uh, currently, over 43% of the Wolf Glen site is landscaped, so there's room for an expansion of about 10,000 square feet of hard surface area while still maintaining that 35% ratio. With approval of RM2 zoning, a total of 63 units could be allowed at Wolf Glen. This would amount to 17 additional units over what's there today. How many of those 17 potentially un new units can be accommodated on the site will be a function of landscaping, parking, access, fire safety, and other design considerations. The Title 20 zoning ordinance provides a solid framework for implementation of, of the growth policy here. Landscaping in the form of activity area and general site landscaping will be required. Uh, to meet Title 20, as will off-street parking. Fire safety and access will be primary considerations in designing an expansion of Wolf Glen, and we've met with the Missoula Fire Department several times to review site concepts and have developed a good understanding of uh, fire, fire safety elements that will need to be incorporated into a design. We've also had several discussions with Missoula Parks and Rec Department uh, regarding landscaping and activity area design. Kate Dinsmore, uh, WGM Group Landscape Architect, is here to discuss landscaping design. Hi, good evening. I'm Kate Dinsmore with Landscape Architect with WGM Group. And uh, currently the site is all focused inward, so the three buildings that you see focus into the parking area. And with the new building, we could potentially have that area focus out into the activity area in the back. The three buildings, the standards weren't the same when this was designed, and so there wasn't an integration of the activity area with the apartment buildings. And so the buildings don't open up onto that activity area. There are no doors on the back side that open to the activity area, and so it's just kind of a forgotten space in the back of the parcel. And so if we were to put a new building on that activity area, yes, it decreases how much open spaces there is, but it would actually have open up onto, that, onto the activity area and uh, it would provide an opportunity for kids to just be able to open the front door, run outside, parents would be able to watch them. And it would activate that area that is currently underused right now. It's, um, it's well maintained, it's a lawn area with trees, but it's not particularly well used by the residents because it is at the back of the site. Um, and additionally, there is the opportunity for the trail connection and the owners have, um, we've discussed this with them, they, you know, we've talked about formalizing that trail connection. It's, um, that informal connection exists right now and is used, but there's a really great opportunity to formalize that and make that a better connection so it can be better used for commuting. Um, 
And then just the picture on the bottom is the back of the building that faces onto the activity area. And as you can see, there's just the windows look out, but there aren't any doors that face onto it. So a new building that opens up onto the activity area with doors uh, would be a really great improvement to the site. Thanks, Kate. The traffic resulting from additional units in Wolf Glen was discussed in depth during the planning board hearing. In response to that discussion, we conducted peak hour traffic counts at the adjacent intersections at uh, Garfield and Wyoming, which is just at the uh, northeast corner of the site, and also at uh, Wyoming and Johnson Street. Uh, peak hour volumes at these intersections ranged from 130 to 250 vehicles uh, per hour total for all movements and it could generally be described as random arrivals uh, and that we noted one group where four vehicles were traveling together but generally uh, the traffic that was counted was a single vehicle traveling without without any congestion the observed intersections operate at a level of service a peak hour uh, peak hour traffic from the 46 existing units of wolf glen was also counted uh, at between 8 and 15 total trips during the peak hour now, using conventional trip generation methods, the 17 possible new units would generate up to 10 trips uh, per the 10 trips per hour and up to 113 additional motor vehicles per day. But with convenient and safe access uh, to an existing mountain line route and to the Milwaukee Trail, it can be assumed that some of these added trips will not be single occupant vehicle trips. As of 2016, the rental vacancy rate in Missoula is below 3% affordable workforce housing is needed in Missoula. The area surrounding Wolf Glen was targeted for medium to high residential density and the growth policy with the aim of providing additional housing in an area that's appropriate for the community. When considering uh, the residential medium to high area shown here, it's important to consider the mixed use nature of this area. With the food bank, police evidence facility, Sussex School, numerous other industrial, institutional and commercial uses, the land available to achieve residential density becomes valuable in achieving the focus inward goals of the growth policy. When we look at the existing housing units in the area uh, that is designated medium to high, there's an existing unit density of just over four units per acre. Uh, that takes into account uh, the commercial, industrial, and institutional development that, that's taken place in this area. So with that in mind, if a residential density within the range called for in the growth policy is to be realized, Wolf Glen will play a, a very important role in that calculation. Uh, with that, we believe it's reasonable to conclude that the impact of the requested rezoning from RM 2.7 to RM 2 is more than offset by the positive impact to the community provided by infill workforce housing. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Anyone else care to comment? Sir. Good evening, Mr. Engen, Mr. Nugent, Council Members. I will read my um, comment again and hope that you take my arguments into consideration. Right on the, okay. And then, Mr. Um, Walser, sir, would you mind identifying yourself for the record, okay. please? Okay, yeah, it's in my first sentence, but I can do it. Fair enough. Um, um, uh, so my name is Kim Walters Kirchen, that's K-I-M-W-A-L-T-E-R-S-K-I-R-C-H-E-N. Long one. And here again. My name is Kim Walters Kirchen. I live at 115 South Garfield Street in close proximity to the Wolf Glen Apartments. I'm a member of the River Road Neighborhood Leadership Team, but this comment reflects my own personal view. I'm very much in favor of infill development, of making good use of existing infrastructure, and of creating housing for people of all income levels close to the city core. But I oppose the proposed zoning change of the Wolf Glen property from RM27 to RM2 and the construction of 17 additional units for the following reasons. Number one, the proposed rezone and the 17 additional units the owners plan to build will severely degrade the quality of life for the current residents of the existing 46 apartments by eliminating the only usable green space of this development. Number two, the rezoning would be out of character with our neighborhood, where large development, multifamily developments leave ample green spaces for their residents, like council groves, the Wyoming townhouses, and the new development of El Cepeda at the end of Trail Street. All three are built at a density of about 16 units per acre, and all three are a stone throw away from the Wolf Glen apartments. 
Also, the area west of Catlin is a vibrant mix of multifamily and single-family homes, of workshops and warehouses, and not predominantly a multifamily area, as the application states. At the current density of 16 units per acre, multifamily and single-family homes can coexist, but the densities over that multifamily developments become easily overwhelming and can make single-family developments nearby impossible, especially if Number three, other owners of already built multifamily developments follow this example and start to rezone to RM2 as well and eliminate all leftover green spaces by filling them up with apartments. They could use the same arguments and how could you deny them if you approve this rezone? Number four, the coexistence of multi and single family units would be further endangered by overtowering buildings, since the new RM2 zoning would allow a building height of 45 feet, which came in quite handy since the declared goal of the owners is to build as many units as possible on this little piece of green. And if approved, nobody could keep them from doing so. Number five, owners of undeveloped land, like myself, might have to follow suit because a nice townhouse development would not work anymore in this apartment-only environment. Number six, eventually the whole area could turn into an apartment ghetto with no green spaces for the residents and with all the social tensions that come with such an amassing of similar apartment types. Number seven, all neighborhood plans for this area underscore that such apartment monoculture should be avoided. A mix of units and income levels is needed for a diverse urban community to flourish. Number eight, the new RM2 zoning might be a good tool to create more units and make better use of the infrastructure, also in our area, but exceeding the current density of 16 units per acre and endangering the balance of multi and single family homes would have to come with a good and convincing plan which takes into account the character of the neighborhood and the quality of life of its residents. Simply using it to maximize the number of units and by doing so eliminating the only green area for the residents would represent a misuse of this newly created zoning district and therefore should be denied. Finally, I wonder if there should, could be a compromise. What if the owners committed to building fewer units, maybe six or eight at a reasonable height, and presented a plan that would make good make a good part of this green space accessible to the new residents as well as to the current residents, maybe as a sizable common area along their internal connection to the bike trail. This way, all parties could benefit. Since the existing apartments have no balconies and no patios, 20% of the southern green space could be set aside as activity area for the current residents, and the new units could be built on the remaining space, adding 20% activity area of their own. Only a bike trail with a little bit of landscaping on either side will clearly be not enough activity area for about 100 to 150 residents of then maybe 63 units and would not meet the green space standards of large apartment develops, developments in our area west of Catlin. Without a plan which ensures the livability of all future residents in regards to the green space and the compatibility with our neighborhood in regards to the building heights, and without a binding commitment of the owners to build that plan, I would ask the City Council to deny this application. It's done. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Walters Kirschen. Mr. Mayor, City Council, my name is Paul Chamberlain, C-H-A-M-B-E-R-L-I-N. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I, like Kim, am opposed to this rezoning. I am a property owner immediately to the south and I may have the property most affected by the uh, proposed rezone. To protect and enhance the livability, diversity and character of our neighborhoods, we worked hard to achieve plans with zoning and guidelines. Some of these plans and guidelines I have been involved with include the Urban Fringe Development Plan, the River Road, Emma Dickinson, infrastructure plan, updated reserve state area plan, Missoula comprehensive plan, Missoula county growth policy update. And all of these plans emphasize livability, diversity, character, and a rural feeling. None of the pressures on the livability, diversity, and character have gotten any better. They're all worse. They're far much, they're much worse. And that's not to mention the rural feeling. Livability, diversity, character, that's language that is absent from the, plan, the current planning board. It was so important not so long ago. 
Uh, specifically, any density denser than what we already have will eliminate any hopes of green or open space. Wolf Glen is a case in point, as Kim said so well. Nearby, Catlin Street is already dangerous. We often have to pull into holes to let oncoming traffic through. Now, during the planning board meeting, the city presented the, the, a case that was very supportive of this, but the timestamp was two o'clock in the afternoon. That is the one time that you can get up and down Catlin Street without having to duck into the safe areas, the, into the parking areas. Wyoming is worse with this type of crowded development. Parking will again be way inadequate. Jamming in more units will only add to congestion, more cars parked on the street. The new, new food bank parking and parking lot is immediately across Wyoming Street, adding even more traffic. Uh, by the way, planning board members cited Wyoming Street unsafe situations where they actually witnessed close calls. Uh, Wyoming is a perfect example to ask, does Missoula planning have any process to learn from past mistakes where we can see and learn from unintended consequences brought on by this type of overfill? The project reflects in an intentional creeping change in character. I think it's planned. All the developer has, or the developer or the speculator has to say is 2%, 2.7 does not pencil. And that seems to be code. And now we have a formula that is rapidly leading to too many apartments, which according to these same developers, speculators can only lead to an apparent apartment ghetto, not the intended diversity, a mix of uh, single houses, industry, and high density. As I canvassed uh, my neighborhood, all my neighbors were opposed, none were for this rezone. So please work to maintain and improve diversity, character, livability, and reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else this evening? Sir. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen of the council, uh, Mr. Mayor, my name is uh, John Gardapi, and I work for the Volunteers of America, the Northern Rockies, in the Supportive Services for Veterans and Their Families uh, program. Our program uh, <clears throat> works to house homeless veterans and has been designed to end uh, the, uh, the problem of having veterans homeless on the street. It also works to uh, um, keep veterans in their housing um, in a uh, preventive mode, excuse me. Um, last year alone, uh, the program here in Missoula housed over one-third of our um, our quota, which was 180 veterans and their family members. The year prior to that, we housed 150. This year, we seek to eclipse the 180 and probably be somewhere around the 200 mark. As we proceed um, from April uh, to May, and now into June, we already have 54 clients. All of but two are housed. So I'm here to speak on behalf of the expansion for the Wolf Glen Apartments. And the reason I'm here to do that um, is because I have six veterans who currently live at the Wolf Glen Apartments. Six veterans who have found not an apartment ghetto, as you have heard these gentlemen express, but who have found home. They have found a place that they can call their own that is so well cared for, above board, every single apartment I've ever inspected. We do housing inspections for every apartment that we, that we um, seek to rent to a veteran, or a veteran seeks to rent, excuse me. And every single apartment that I've ever viewed at Wolf's Glen is above and beyond what you would find anywhere else for that price range. The people at Wolf's Glen, the family that <coughs> operates it, treat their residents like family. Their desire is not to expand so that they can 
make more money or, or expand their business, but to be able to offer a service to disabled senior citizens, veterans, and other members of the community. Now, I can't sit here and talk to you about all the numbers and all of that, but what I can tell you is this. Out of the six residents that have rented, excuse me, I should say seven, there's six there now, only one is left, and that one left to purchase his own home. After two years of being at Wolf's Glen, he saved enough money to purchase his own home and move on and move up. The other six are still there and they love where they live and they love the apartment building, they love the neighborhood, and they love the people who rent them that space. The other thing is it's very uh, centrally located to the food bank and I'm, I'm glad you guys put that where it's at. I'm glad that that expansion was approved. I'm glad that the, the food bank has grown so big because there are so many that need it. I see it every day. So having access to the food bank from the Wolf's Glen Apartments and Kitty Corner is essential to their survival and their ability to achieve independence from our program. So um, I would move that you guys approve this expansion on behalf of all the veterans who seek to find home, seek to find a place to call their own, a place that they can walk into and feel at home. Every veteran who rents at the Wolf's Glen Apartments don't speak about the greenery. They speak about the apartment building that they walk into, the home that they walk into, the cleanliness, the space, the washer and dryer provided in every single apartment building. They speak about home. The last veteran that I just rented the service to, uh, or they rented to, excuse me, uh, an apartment building, um, I was having a great difficulty trying to find a place for him and his partner. With the help of Martin's property management, uh, we worked to get them into the apartment and address their needs. I got a phone call the day after, or actually you should say the day of, signing their lease. And it was a phone call that made me cry. Um, and all he could say over and over again was, I'm at home. I'm at home. I'm at home. I can't believe it. I'm at home. Now, I've seen a lot of apartment buildings all around here, and I do work with a lot of landlords, a lot of property management companies. And we have since expanded our ability to get veterans into housing. But I will tell you, that Wolf's Glen is probably the number one place that I look and seek for open apartments and I don't find them very often because people stay there. It's very difficult. When I do find them, I work as hard as I can to get individuals in there because I know the care that they receive, I know what they're like, and I know that they'll be home to all the veterans that I serve. Thank you, Mr. Garpy. I've been a little loose with the three-minute rule tonight, but I think... What's that? I think I've been a little loose with our three-minute rule tonight, but and I think... And uh, you get that three and a half minutes. That's yeah. The only thing that scares me about public speaking was you were going to chew me out about <laughs> the three and a half minutes. I could talk forever, but I want you guys to understand something. It's not an apartment ghetto. It's a home. It's a place for people to call home. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Anyone else this evening? Yes, ma'am. My name is Vicki Robbins, and I manage the Wolf Glen Apartments. Um, it was family ran. Uh, we take pride in our apartments and who we get in there. Um, I'm not very good at public speaking, so excuse me. Um, but uh, I just thought maybe I'd introduce myself to you guys. Um, I love what I do, and I love the people that are in there, and look out for everybody. So. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else this evening? 
All right, with that, I will close the public hearing. Are there questions from council members? Ms. Cares? Mr. Harvey, could you discuss the Wyoming street width? Mr. Larson mentioned something about a discrepancy, and I was not clear on that. Sure. Uh, Doug Harvey, City Engineering Development Services. Yeah, I went out uh, at uh, Drew's request and looked again at Wyoming Street. It's uh, something I've been involved in since it was practically a dirt road. Um, took some measurements. Wyoming Street right now, through the apartments um, up in here, is at 35 feet uh, curb to curb, which is the design uh, criteria per our zoning, our subdivision regulations for a residential street. Since then, uh, because of development in the area and the reclassification of the streets, as it has been reclassified as a uh, collector uh, because it's over a thousand cars per day. Um, so, and we've identified a number of problems or been uh, made aware of a number of problems when. Uh, the biggest problem is when Bitterroot Welding and some of these companies were in here, they were clear out with stuff clear out to here. Uh, Wyoming Street down here is 45 to 41 feet wide. And next down all of a sudden to 32 right against these, uh, these commercial areas. 45 is really way too wide for a, a residential street or even a collector. Um, so. And then I also noted at the same time that there's four available parking spaces on the north side of Wyoming along these apartments. There was nine cars parked there. Uh, four were legally parked. The rest were in front of fire hydrants in yellow zones, blocking driveways, in front of the mailboxes, that sort of thing. Plus there's about four rigs parked across the sidewalk. Um, so we recognize that there's a problem. Um, Wyoming is a focus. In fact, uh, we looked at Wyoming when we were applying for the CDGB grants. Uh, the cost, the bang for the buck was a little more than we really wanted to spend CDGB. But um, this alignment right here will set the alignment for the street. And you can see where it's cutting it back into this stuff. So the street can be run as a collector street. There would have to be some changes, possibly to the parking. Um, on the street, but um, most of the complaints we got about the congestion was the fact that uh, right in that area where those those work um, those shops and things were were encroaching, you know, 20, 30 feet out into the right of way. Thanks. I just had two related questions. How wide is the street just to the east of the industrial area in front of the subject property? Okay, so. Right here, this sets the width at 35 feet back to back, which is exactly what a residential street with parking on both sides is. And then it stays that width through here, and then right where these driveways were, we bulbed these out to keep vehicles parked uh, away from parking against these driveways. So here we're down to a street width that allows, or that does not really allow for parking on the south side and I, I believe it's about 28 feet right here. And then from here on, we go back up to 35 feet. And then down there by the, um, when we built that area down by the, um, the good food store, or not the good food store, but the uh, food bank, uh, we had a number of trailers on the south side of the street that were angle parking and backing in the street. So we actually used the boulevard on the north side of the street to facilitate parking for the trailers on the south side of the street. So, but the street width ma maintains the same, it's just that we move the parking into the boulevard area. And then um, how wide is it suggested to be for a collector? A collector with parking on both sides is 8, 8, and, eight, eight and 20. So, uh, so it would be uh, 36 feet. So it's really only a couple feet short of being a collector size with parking on both sides. Further questions? Mr. Wilkins? So I'd like to get the, uh, talk to the guy that's Wester. I can't say your last name. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, so would you come on up, please? So 
So several years ago, we were involved in a property over there that kind of wanted to do the same thing, and uh, we got it shut down. Is this the same property? No. But this is not. Okay. But that I, property I will kept be trying to figure you. that one out. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's all I really okay. needed to know. And then, Doug, if you'd come up, I have one about, uh, so off of Catlin Street, you take Trail Street. Is that involved in this property at all? Not, not at all. Not at uh, all. Okay. It comes off a of second Garfield and Trail. And that's where these gentlemen that spoke access off a of trail. Right. And, uh, and so this doesn't affect that other than just the trail connection uh, to Trail Street, so to speak. So the access is all on Wyoming on this. All right. Thanks, Doug. One, my last question would be for uh, the developers. Uh, yes, sir. Jeff, right? Yes. Uh, you stated somewhere in there that the uh, the Riverfront Council approved this, or was it a tie? There wasn't an action taken. It was an informational item during uh, one of their neighborhood leadership team uh, committee meetings. So okay. we, we presented the project to them and asked for their input. But they did take a vote, right? There uh, was no vote. Oh, okay. Thank you. Ms. Marley? I appreciate the um, updates on the traffic studies in the area. In committee last week, I asked about um, uh, street connectivity because a big issue in this part of town is like a lack of s street grids. Um, I'm concerned less about like the width of Wyoming at any certain point, which is important too. Eventually, it'll need to be all brought up to standards, but I'm even more concerned about the lack of grid system and I my question is if any staff in public works or planning or anyone else on City Council um, is aware of any concerted effort to make a street plan for that area to acquire right-of-way or the e egress and ingress and egress from this neighborhood is pretty limited and um, it's something to think about as we try to develop inward. Mr. Herbie? Uh, yes. Um, Johnson Street, of course, is one of the prime candidates for North-South Street. Um, we actually had an arrangement to run Johnson all the way uh, through a property owner all the way to uh, River Road, but Lafray Park was already dedicated and uh, we that was kind of killed by Lafray Park. Uh, we still are hoping on Johnson uh, north of this area that some of the the big vacant areas develop off uh, to the east side of Curtis Street and we can swing Johnson around to line up Lafray Lane. South of this area um, when we built 3rd Street we relocated the driveway into the Jensen property to line up with Johnson Street for future um, development of that of the uh, Jensen property and uh, we stubbed out sewer and water to serve that area uh, for a future connection and then the apartments well they don't show up here but the apartments I guess they do a little bit um, these apartments right here uh, were built by Drake Lamb and he dedicated I actually bought uh, easement from him to connect the south end of Johnson Street to the Jensen property in anticipation of running, uh, connecting Johnson at least to 3rd Street. So it's ready to go. Really what the, the what has to happen is the Jensen's need to develop their lot or their property to, to allow us to uh, get a dedicated right of way through there to connect up with that easement in the, the north in the, uh, our North Johnson Street. And Catlin, you know, has been on the radar as a connection uh, north to, uh, from Idaho to River Road, um, but that would require acquisition of some property and things like that. So, yeah, you know, it's on the radar. Johnson Street looks like it's going to be a candidate fairly soon, but, uh, and Catlin maybe at some point in time, we don't know, with a changes that the state's doing to River Road, Catlin would be a natural connection. 
And in addition, with Catlin, we did uh, facilitate a signal at, at 3rd Street. There's conduits in and everything ready to be signalized if the money ever comes available or the, the warrants come available. And then, of course, the signal at Wyoming, Wyoming and Russell will help improve all that, too. And we recognize that <coughs> Curtis and Davis and River Road all need infrastructure improvements. Okay. Ms. Bentley? No. Mr. Debari? You're next, Ms. West, followed by Mr. Wilkins. Mr. Herbie, another question for you. Thanks so much for all that information. You ticked off a couple of items on my list. I wanted to revisit, though, I think maybe it was Mr. Larson who talked about a 10 to 12 foot easement along the south side of maybe he said a right-of-way along the south side of the property which seems to me to be like where the old Milwaukee Railroad used to be and I'm curious what is that right-of-way is it part of an alley is it part of a street that's not fully realized as a full width of right-of-way what is our interest in it and what is what is its possibility of being perfected you know, John, I don't know the answer to that for sure. Just speculation. Uh, I know that when Parks was trying to run the trail through following the Milwaukee right away as far as possible, that they acquired easements and that there was some discontinuation with easements with, uh, with a bowling alley. Uh, they put up a workshop or a, a shed right in it where we needed the easement and then with these businesses right off of the west side of Catlin. I'm just making an assumption that that may have been uh, some of the easement that was acquired by Parks. I don't know for sure, John. I haven't really done any work in that area. I, I have a, a larger question that has to do with bringing our zoning in line with our growth policy. I guess, um, I guess, oh. There are parts of towns that are zoned special district, you know, and we've been holding off rezoning them till we know more about like the Brook Street corridor specifically. And so I was wondering uh, what the process is overall for bringing these areas of town maybe in line with our growth policy and revisiting it on a broader scale than on a parcel by parcel basis. Uh, so you're speaking of like a city or city initiated zoning? Okay, um, well, uh, I, I believe the city council has that prerogative um, to initiate that zoning. And, and the one that you were referring to was that special district number two that aligns with the Reserve Street Corridor, which was a, uh, I mean, it was written as a, a very suburban highway special zoning district with very large setbacks. And so that's the area that we're likely gonna first look at. Um, so it would be a, you know an interest from city council members issuing a referral to direct city staff to look at a larger area and it, or larger areas rezoning uh, now along with that i would anticipate that that would be a year to two year process i mean when uh city council says that, no we've got this growth policy that the city adopted but we want to rezone your area you know i that's going to take extensive outreach saying that you know city council wants to rezone you versus you know a private property owner wanting to rezone to reflect the growth policy and so it's i would anticipate that being a very very large public process but not necessarily unreasonable if staff time is available does that answer your question okay mr wilkins so drew you is it does this uh Development trigger uh, uh, cash for parts instead of uh, no no uh, multi multifamily development is not there is no cash in lieu that's a that's like a subdivision requirements okay yeah. further questions all right seeing none Mr Debari as a point of process do we want to save the motion till we went when we actually take action I'm sorry. As a point of process, do we want to save the motion until when we actually take action on this? Because we're not taking action this evening. Do what? 
Oh, I, I ignored that completely. Um, yeah, I guess we'll wait. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order on this question? Mr. Barry? So as a, a matter of uh, process as well, when this comes back before us, uh, we'll have the opportunity for discussion and public comment if someone Correct. is interested. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. All right. With that, we have no additional public hearings this evening. I will pass on communications from the mayor. We'll begin general co council comments with Mr. Von Losberg this evening. Ms. Hedall, Mr. Dabari, and Ms. Marler. Uh, while the owners of this property are still here, I just wanted to um, say that I, it's on one of my running routes and it's a nice property. You can tell from the street it's well taken care of and quiet and leafy. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for coming down. Thank everybody for coming down. Ms. Armstrong, Mr. Wilkins. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, a veterans issue, actually. Um, Fourth of July is coming. Fireworks are coming. Rockets are whistling in the air. Remember that it's illegal to do that in the city limits. And I know that doesn't stop that. But veterans, some of them coming back from war zones, this triggers that memory in their mind. And it's not good. It, it brings anxiety out. It might bring panic attacks out. It's just not good. So you need to really know when you're shooting off your fireworks in your neighborhood, if there's a veteran living around there and you need not do it. Uh, so I hope that uh, taken the heart by a lot of people. Ms. Kears. My comment is for the property owners of Glen Wolf also, not related to the rezone. I The only thing I've ever heard negative is that folks can't recycle very easily there. And so I'm sure you've heard about that a lot, but I just wanted to communicate. Let's chat afterwards. Um, <coughs> thanks for caring about recycling. Oh, okay, she's looking into it, she said from the audience. Thanks. Mr. Hess, Ms. West. Ms. Jones, Ms. Bentley, Ms. Swaney. I just wanted to wish a happy 50th birthday to Kevin Kicking Woman. With that, we have no committee reports this evening. We do have one item of new business, and that's a res uh, an amendment to the water system bond resolution. Mr. Bickle, would you like to speak to that, please? <laughs> Yes, Dale Bickle, Chief Administrative Officer. Uh, before you is a resolution to amend the bond, anticipate, bond anticipation notes that we issued last Thursday um, for the acquisition of the water system. And uh, what this clarification does, it's, it's, it's somewhat stating the obvious, but it's, it's, um, it's that city council will covenant to um, use any legal means necessary to pay any judgments related to the ongoing condemnation case. There's three types of claims that were reserved um, under, under the, in the condemnation suit related to interest, um, attorney's fees, and property taxes. Uh, we've reserved uh, you know, a, a $25.3 million in the Series B note and another $2.9 million has been coveted by council earlier, but this is just to clarify that if there's other judgments beyond those amounts, which we think the possibility of that is remote, that um, the city would have, would have to pay those. Um, now that we actually own the water system itself, that is self-evident. If there's a claim against the city related to anything, we're, we're liable for that, uh, but this gives some clarification um, to our lenders that, um, that essentially, you know, council is um, supportive and acquisition and, is, and it will continue to be that way. Thank you, Mr. Pickle. Uh, let's have a motion and we can go from there. Ms. Marler. I move that we adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Missoula amending and supplementing resolution number 8144 relating to the city's water system revenue bond anticipation notes, series 2017A and water system revenue bond anticipation notes, series 2017. 2017B to provide for the city's pledge of a general fund obligation bond for the payment of additional litigation liability if necessary and to provide for other matters properly relating thereto. 
That motion is in order. Discussion on the motion? Mr. Wilkins? So I'm not sure if I really understand this. Uh, we're pledge of the general fund. So that are we talking about the general, the city's general fund that we would pay anything out of? No. Uh, well, not necessarily, I guess I should say. The um, pledge is, is really to, for any legal means. The, the, um, so if there is a pledge beyond the $25.3 million that's in the Series B note and the $2.9 million that was limited obligation, um, that we would use any legal means. And that, the, the, the likely source of that is additional water revenue, um, is a, a water revenue bond source. And, and for example, like the Series B, when we talked about that last time, that $2.9 million, it, it's just, it's just it, it would be an, uh, an instrument that's backed by that. It would still, you know, through this process, we've always said that water will pay for water. Um, it's just that to the extent that we would need to bring additional credit related to it if something, um, uh, you know, if, if suddenly revenues were sufficient to generate that, that we would have um, general fund potential to, to back it. But um, so that's really just for the credit aspect of it. So in other words, it could come out of the general. It could come out. It would be. It would be. But it would be related to decisions that would, that, that council would make in the future. So how about the last sentence in there? If necessary, and to provide for other matters, properly related there too. That's kind of an open end, isn't it? That so yeah, and so this, I mean, this resolution is specifically limited to um, the the matters related to the condemnation case. So that's other matters, but it's related to the condemnation suit. The only there's only three things we left related in the condemnation suit. So this resolution is narrowed to this suit. That said, you know, um, Missoula Water is now a department of the city. So the, any judgment related un, in the condemnation case or unrelated is going to be a judgment against the city. You know, it's 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 our water system. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Dabari? To follow up on what Mr. Wilkins was saying, um, because as you just said, the, it's now the Missoula Water Company and, any, and we own the water company and we're subject to any range of obligations, the, the resolution per se is, as you just said, related to the condemnation case, but if we were to under be, uh, how do I want to say this? If, if we were to be a part of a subsequent lawsuit for something completely unrelated to condemnation, this would be a matter that we would have to address as a council to, uh, to take care of funding any judgment or court case or anything, right? I guess my point is, is that by and large, this resolution is related to just finishing up what we're doing with regard to the condemnation case and any expenses related to running the water system, whether that's some kind of legal action or whatever, is something that basically that will be taken care of as it comes up. Yes, that's correct. Yes. And while you're there, I, you, you talked a little bit about the Series B bond and um, the two point was it $9 million, uh, $2.9 $2 million in uh, other bonding? Just for the record, can you just round out the entire discussion with regard to the cost uh, associated with this and the portion of that related to the Series A bonding? Yeah, so do you want me to, just to make clear I understand the question, to, to uh, describe the, 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 the financing that we did, the Series A and the Series B notes and, and, the, and the components of that? Right, exactly. Yes. Okay, yes I can. So we issued, um, let me see if I find a good summary here. I have the um, closing instructions in front of me. Um, okay, uh, so we issued um, uh, $112,925,000 was the Series A note. $83.8 million, .8 million of that went to Mountain Water. $6.8 million of that went to the, um, the 
petitioner developers, the developers that had settled with Mountain Water, and that and that portion came out of the condemnation proceeds. There was a uh, 3.2 million was a Liberty Park Water service fee. Um, we issued 3.8 million dollars for um, future capital expenditures, um, and um, part one of the covenants was a 2.5 million dollar capital contingency fund. Um, there is 1.1 million in escrow related to the award of attorney's fees for Carlisle. Um, we issued $9.2 million of it related to costs incurred by the city related to the acquisition and $2.4 million were closing costs related to the transaction itself. On the Series B side, um, we reserved $19.9 million for um, uh, for a potential interest claim, $4.3 million for a property tax claim, and $4 million for uh, a potential of additional attorney's fees. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? So all the money that we've been paying for attorney's fees all these years and months, will that be reimbursed back to the city from this bond? Is that what the $9.2 million is? Yes, and it has been. Further discussion? Seeing none, anyone in the audience care to comment on the resolution? Uh, Bob Moore again. I didn't quite follow all those numbers, but I got a genuine question. Where are all these expenses in the budget that you have submitted to the taxpayers. Missoula paper wrote up 3.87% increase. These numbers sound to me like they're gonna be a lot more than the one or two million dollars of new items that the paper reported on. Maybe they got it wrong, I don't know. They're saying the budget you submitted is 3.87% over. None of those, these numbers you're talking about is in there. None of them. Where is the budget that you're submitting to the taxpayers? I think the budget should be reworked and all of these expenses be properly reported to the taxpayers. Thank you. Anyone else care to comment? Seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote on the resolution. On the resolution, Debari. Yes. Debari votes yes. Heddle. Yes. Heddle votes yes. Hess. Yes. Hess votes yes. Jones. Jones votes yes. Marler. Marler votes yes. Sweeney. Sweeney votes yes. Von Lossberg. Yes. Von Lossberg votes yes. West. West votes yes. Wilkins. Wilkins votes yes. Armstrong. Armstrong votes yes. Bentley. Bentley votes yes. And Cares. Cares votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? It's 12 eyes. And the motion is approved. We have, uh, are there any additional items to be referred? Any miscellaneous communications, petitions, reports, or announcements? Ms. Ben. <laughs> wow. Uh, with that, as always, ladies and gentlemen, I am grateful for your service, and we will be adjourned.